Welcome to the show. I'm so excited that you guys are joining me today because I have my friend, Megan Reimer from The Autistic Lady. She has an amazing blog. Guys, we're going to be talking about workplace. We're going to be talking about some options. If you're in a job that's just not working and aligning with your needs and you're learning that, Hey, I've got different sensory needs and really all the accommodations in the world aren't going to make this jive. There's got to be something different and I'm ready to try something. Megan's got some wonderful insights and we're going to dive into those in just a sec. Stick around. Hi, I'm Carol Jean, founder and host of Mind Your Autistic Brain talk show and community. And you're about to experience the new way to thrive in life and relationships as a late identified autistic by unveiling who you are, how you communicate, finding your self-care plan from the inside out, and being the authentic creator of your best life. Get ready, because this is where we go against the mainstream, say no to outdated society norms, and we say yes to who we are in order to create a joy-filled, balanced, and more neurodistinct world. Welcome to Mind Your Autistic Brain. Welcome to the show, Megan. I'm so excited you're here. Thank you for joining me today. Hi, it's so so great to finally meet you in person, like I was saying earlier. Um, and yeah, I I guess we'll just keep going from there. <laughs> we'll just keep going from there. Megan, when were you identified as autistic? Uh, so I found out that I was autistic. I was formally diagnosed on May 19th of 2021 um, at 31 years old. And this was after going through just a kind of quick summary of that, but this is kind of after going through starting, you know, years of depression, uh, anxiety, struggling in the workplace, whether it was my current workplace or previous workplaces, um, being diagnosed with bipolar, uh, <laughs> finding out that was not the case, uh, various medications that fun fact didn't work because, I'm, you know, not bipolar or any of those things. I do have my one medication for that is an antidepressant to help me with uh, depression and manage my anxiety at times. But, you know, now it's at a, man, a much lower level than it was pre-diagnosis. And um, getting diagnosed was one of those journeys that I just, I'm so happy I did it. Like it was, it was a long road to get where I am right now, but yeah, it was so, so worth it to do that. Not that, you know, I know a lot of people self-diagnose and I totally think that's valid, but you know, for me, I just needed, I needed the formal diagnosis. I needed to know for sure. Um, so really I would love to talk about Megan, sort of your, your work journey that you're on right now and where you are with that and, and what new opportunity, cause you, you were sharing with me before we started recording, yep. you have this new opportunity that's coming up in April. I'm really excited to hear about, and I know that it's something that other people may really be interested to hear, uh, as something as an option that they'd like to look in. Now, remember you are in Canada. A lot of us are in the United States, the UK, yep. New Zealand, Australia. So everything's going to be a little bit different. Um, but there are very, but there are very similar programs, um, in all different countries. And so we're going to try and hopefully maybe get just different names, different to think about it names. yeah, and look for the yeah. option. Right. So share Absolutely. with us what you got going on, Megan. So, um, with work, I mean, just to not go to briefly say my issues that I faced, I was not diagnosed until only last year. So prior, when I was first hired at my current job, I was hired in 2015. And at that point had no diagnosis, right? Nothing. I didn't even, I wasn't even diagnosed bipolar. Then. I was just, I was just there. Okay. I was waiting on lists for psychiatrists and all this. So I didn't even know I needed accommodations. I started in a call center. So yeah. And as an autistic, that is not a good place to end up. But again, I didn't know. Right. And immediately started getting burned out within three months of that. So I took various leaves of absences. I can't even tell you how many anymore, but it destroyed my career. It, it effectively did because people don't recover and realize that they like, unfortunately aren't forgiving and that they, you know, oh, this person hasn't been here in this long, even though they've gotten themselves, whatever it might be, the problem is 
um, they just don't see you as a reliable person anymore. Um, when I did get diagnosed as bipolar, um, one of the big recommendations was you should no longer be in a call center anymore. Okay. Well that worked out for me autistic wise, because I shouldn't be, that was the beginning of my first grievance that I filed, which was, they were trying to tell me that they couldn't accommodate me and that they, they essentially hinted that I should look at medical retirement. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, no, no, you're not going to do this to me. Filed a grievance within about a month. They suddenly had a new spot for me. Wow. Isn't that cool? So I moved downstairs from the call center into a, what we consider to be a processing role. And what was different about that is that I was in a, I was in an, like a cubicle, still have all the lighting and all this began, still didn't know I was autistic. So I, but I did have more control over my workload, what was coming in. I didn't have calls flying in. Like I could control my calls that I made out. So I tried that for a bit, still was not working, still was on leaves of absences. Finally came back in 2019, did more adjustments there where we removed phone calls, any kind of client interaction period, just removed it, took it all out and said, this is too unpredictable. I want to just do, you know, type on the computer, or make decisions this way, whatever. And then that, no, and then that December, they removed my accommodation. And they cited that, well, our management is just all on vacation. We don't have enough people to accommodate you. So therefore you're going to send letters for all of Christmas time, which at the, for me was very insulting. And it was defeating to me because it made me feel like, well, my disability doesn't matter to you. Clearly, if you're going to do this to me, never mind that it's illegal to do that. You can't just remove an accommodation that you've agreed to put in filed another grievance. And ultimately at that point was burnt out and angry, went on leave. And that's what started my autism journey <laughs> to where we are. Fast forward, go back to work again, try again in June of this last year, 2021, tried working from home, worked way better because fun fact, when you're autistic and you work from home, <laughs> you get high, <laughs> you can control your own environment. You control your lights. You can control your, your temperature and your sound and these get wonderful headphones like this and <laughs> you know, like all these things. And it was working well, but unfortunately that past experiences was just, you know, that prejudice or whatever you want to call it is still there and I can feel it. And it, you know, it's, it's not even being said to me. It's just, I can feel it. So I came to the crossroad where I'm at now, where now it's okay. How do I go forward? Do I want to keep going and doing this? Like I have tried various accommodations that are wonderful for autistic people. Maybe some people might've been fine, but my big thing is not so much that now the accommodations aren't there. It's the accommodations are there, but now I don't feel good in my job. I don't feel valued. I don't feel like I have opportunities for growth. I can do more. I know I can. So if I'm not going to get them here, then maybe it's time to go elsewhere. Where do I go? So, but that was my big question. My, where do I go? <laughs> um, you know, I said, I have a psych degree and I have this job. And then before that, I have a bunch of retail experience and nothing else. So I was, I am seeing a therapist and she recommended getting what's called a vocational assessment. And that can be called all different things, but vocational assessment is essentially, I, I hate to refer to autism as a, as a disability, because I really, really don't like calling my, I don't like referring to myself as disabled. Um, but for the sake of argument, that is what we're calling it right now, just strictly due to the fact that it is under most, you know, acts out there, whatever mental health acts or human rights acts and whatever it is considered to be a medical disability. So for this argument's sake, I'm just saying it like that so that I don't offend anybody. And um, so it looks at your disability and, and any others that you might have co-occurring conditions, which we, most of us have, um, you know, me, it's anxiety and uh, sleep apnea, you know, other people, I don't know. And it looks at your skills, your past work experience. And I have the added benefit of where I'm going through, I'm going through a center a place called the red path center out of Toronto, Ontario. And what's great about this place is this is where I got diagnosed. Um, they are a neurodivergent. They only deal with neurodivergent people. Um, and specifically adults. 
So, I mean, I, when I found this place and that it existed and it became so accessible during the pandemics, I don't live in Toronto. Um, for me, it would be like a six hour drive. So the fact that I could access this virtually and it was cheaper on top of that, more cost effective, I said, hello, <laughs> I'm going there. Right. And so what they do is this is a contact as a social worker affiliated with them. So she's trained specifically to deal with um, neurodivergent folks. And she'll look at, as long as I grant her access, which I will, uh, access to my report. So my formal diagnosis, she's going to have access to that and be able to use everything she gathers from me against that report and then say, okay, so this is what everything says. Here's where you might fit. Here's a job opportunity that, that could work for you. Here are our ideas. Here's what you could do to get to those places. And then in turn as well, different accommodations that maybe I never even thought of, um, Cause you can also use this towards, even if I wasn't quitting my job right down the line or looking into something like that, you know, it also looks at your accommodations, like what, what would work amazingly for you. And I, so I, when I realized that that was something that could be done, I said, okay, like this sounds like a wonderful idea because now I can assess everything and have all the information on the table and go, okay, where do I belong? You know, like back to school time, where do I belong? Right. Like, <laughs> and, and finally get to that piece where I'm not burning out consistently every six months. I just find something that I love that I can go forward in that I can do what I need to do. And then, you know, <laughs> go home at night. Right. So to speak. I think so. that's what happens. And I love that. That is fantastic. And I think that's something everybody needs. I don't care what your neurotype. I think every human needs yeah. an assessment to say, Hey, these, these are the accommodations and not, I, I even I hate to even use the word accommodations. Cause I think that's just not really representative. And especially the term reasonable accommodations, boy, does that really chop my biscuits? I but, agree. I but what I do say love, that. but what I Agreed. love is like a needs assessment because all humans have needs. We all have a variety of needs. We have varying levels of need. And when our needs are met to what works for us best, we perform and we, we thrive. And no matter what that is, and I think that's something that needs to be part of everyday life for every human. Mm -hmm. It's just like a needs assessment. Let's help you figure out because sometimes we have needs that we don't recognize. And those are the signposts that show up in our life, especially when we're in autistic burnout. And it's like, oh my God, my executive functioning just went down the toilet. Well, you can't function at your best when your needs are unmet. And when your needs are chronically consistently unmet, those signposts start coming up and they've been coming up for a long time, but you don't recognize what they are. And then until you hit a burnout so bad that you can hardly function, mm -hmm. That's like right. you, you articulating, speaking, you know, that may be one of those things where you may be like me and you feel like you're losing your mind and you're going crazy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no, I mean, exactly. there are so many levels of burnout, but what happens so often is that in late identified life, we can look back and this is where I really specialize in help people sort of start to unpack and uncover their autistic mm -hmm. burnouts. Mm -hmm. And that is you get in this cycle, this chronic cycle loop of a burnout death, <laughs> essentially. It's yeah. this, you know, yeah. you're on the hamster wheel, you get off, you start feeling oh, yeah. a little bit better. You, you're like, okay, I got this. I'm doing better. Yep. I mean, you know, I did some stuff. I took care of myself, you know, and I'm going back to life as usual. And you operate back, quote unquote, yeah. life as usual. And the next thing you know, you're right back where you started. And you're like, how the yeah. hell did I get here? I was doing well. Exactly. And there was one wonderful woman. I, sorry. Nope. She's not, she doesn't identify that way. I apologize. She, den I, she identifies as they, and I just did that. So apologies. But they're all divergent rebel on autism. On lyric. Yeah, I love lyric. 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 They are fantastic. Right. And Lyric just did a wonderful post about, um, geez, what the heck I was, I had a whole thought, you know, when you have a thought and then it goes away and then you're like, I had a point. I had the points. I think that's part of this. Bring the that I'm back. Um, but the big, Oh, I remember. So, uh, they did a, a video, um, 
And the video was just talking about the autistic burnout that that lyric experience um, that they are now coming out of and uh, what they did to come out of it. And one of the big things that was highlighted was I need to change my entire life. I need to be honest with myself about what I can and can't do. And I think that's a big thing I've noticed in our community is that people really, 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 myself included, want to try and be like a neurotypical. And the fact of the matter is we're not neurotypical. We're neurodiverse and that's okay. We need to just find what is good for us. If that means not working full-time hours, then that means not working full-time hours. I know that that's hard financially because I've lived paycheck to paycheck. I've gone through, I'm still coming out of debt. Um, you know, and maybe that's okay. So I can't do, maybe I need to look at a career change, like what I'm doing. Maybe it's, maybe it's not working period. And it, that's also okay too. It's sometimes we try everything possible to work, to be a part and to feel like you're included in quote unquote society. Let's just call yeah. it that, you know, to contribute, do your part, so to speak. But there comes a point where maybe our part is not there. Maybe it's something else. And I don't know what it is. Everybody might be different, right? It might be volunteering. It might be, uh, I'm looking at my cat, fostering cats. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but everybody has a place and it's just to find what is your place. And I really, really honestly believe that everyone has one. It's just, you have to find it. You have to be willing to do the work and decide that your life could be better. And that's what I'm now doing is finally saying this is it. It's not easy. It's incredibly hard. It's depressing. And some days you feel like an absolute quote unquote failure. Um, and you think, geez, why can't I just, you know, really and truly, if I could just be like everyone else and go and work my job and just shut my mouth, then everything would be great because I would have a consistent income. Everything would work out and I get to retirement and I get my pension, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. All these things. But right. the reality is I, that's not who I am. I, the reality I is I won't make it to retirement because I'm going to die. That's well, because yeah. I'm working. I'm killing myself slowly. Yes. Doing I'm burning out over and over again, you know, and I, and I think it's accepting that when you've tried so many times, like I have, where you've said, you know, and, and that's what I needed. I know I don't regret anything I've done. I've said I, every time it was, I tried a new, a new accommodation. So whether it was in the office, switching from call center to uh, just a straight cubicle office, no call center, sent whatever center center <laughs> or working from home and all these, you know, and I found what works out of those things. I know working from home is my jam. I know that, but you know, still there were those, there are those things that come out of that go, yeah, this doesn't work, you know, and that's okay. And I, and I'm still trying to tell myself that every day that it's okay. And that, you know, it's not the end of the world. We can, we make it such a big deal. And there's another book I've been reading and, um, geez, what is it? The, the subtle art of not giving up. Oh yeah. Have you ever read <laughs> That's it? That's a good one. I have that on my wish list. And I've actually read a couple of the okay. chapters I downloaded, you, have, you know, the preview. Yeah, yeah. You have to read it, the whole thing. Like I just started to read this. I I got it. I didn't even buy it. <laughs> my an ex-boyfriend from I don't even know how many years ago bought it for me when saw I was struggling with some things going on. You need to read this book. Like I'm telling you, you got to read it. And I said, ah, whatever. And I put it away and I just said, yeah, I will read it. And you know what made me read it where I was, I was like, well, it's sitting there and it's a big orange book. So I should read it. But also my grandfather, before he passed last year was big into this book. He just talked about this stupid book over and over, <laughs> like, you know, and I said, okay, fine. Well, I'll, you know, and that's actually what convinced me was the connection there that mm -hmm. I really wanted to feel with him and that. So I started to read it and I'm someone that when I read, I love to read. However, when I read, I scat, I'm scatterbrained. I have to be very hooked and very, like very determined to read a book. I can read an article. I can read something small where I can see the end of the end of it. But when it's a book, I have to be very hooked by the author. And if I'm not, I'm scatterbrained and I'm like, oh, my phone went off. Let's grab the phone. Oh, look, it's raining out. Let's go look at the window. Oh, look at the raindrops. You know, <laughs> like it's this. I'm with you. I, I just can't. But this one hooked me. It hooked me in. 
And it's, you know what the philosophy of it is, is that what I like is he tells stories like realistic, which I love, blunt, which I also love stories history stories so okay. oh he tells a story about like one of the Beatles members that got kicked out or he tells about I don't even uh a, a previous Metallica member that then fell on Megadeth uh some Japanese uh, em- uh the soldier who thought it was in stolen World War II for 30 years like and he uses these stories to connect to his points which are blunt and in your face, and there's no fluff. And that's the thing with these self-help books. They're all fluff. There's so much fluff around the point. And you know, totally. you're, reading it, you're reading it and you're just like, you read through the, uh, the chapter and they build up their point. And you're like, okay, it's the next chapter. You get to the next chapter, you read it and go, well, where's the point next? Like, is that the point? Do I get to the end? And you tell me on the very last page, is this all fluff? Like till you get to your point and I can't stand that, but he's in your face every chapter. Like, here's how it is. And the point is simply, we're all in a world where we feel very much like we need to be special and that we're competing against one, one another when really in reality, we're just all people living our lives and we need to accept that that's okay. And to just sort of build from that is, is kind of the philosophy of what he's trying to say is to stop thinking of yourself as this. I need to get to, you know, I don't know for me say, I need to get the big promotion and do all these things. Why does it matter? What are you, what are you getting out of that? More stress? Okay, great. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. It was oh boy, do I. Yes. I'm, I'm definitely going to go back and revisit my list now and probably move that up the, up the, just up just, the list to the top. You know, that's good. really a, such a big part of, of what I do when I coach, um, because it was such a big part of my own personal journey because mm-hmm. I, I lived in that mentality of people pleasing. Yeah people pleasing myself to death. And I was, I was making sure I was pleasing everybody else, but myself. Mm -hmm. And I think so many autistics who are late identified, we've of course taking masking to the, the nth degree of professionalism and turned it into camouflaging. (laughs) We're we're the the professional of masking. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. We, we are camouflagers and that has, allowed us to safely survive, but it has not allowed us to thrive. Agreed. And there's so much about our own identity and self-worth and our integrity of, and by integrity, I mean the internal world that we think and experience not aligning with our external world. And when those two things are in opposition, you don't feel like you're grounded. You don't feel like you have a place in the world. You don't That's feel right. like you're just like visiting from another planet when that is the case, because, you know, camouflaging and people pleasing and making sure that we're doing all the stuff to fit into these societal norms has disconnected us so much from ourselves. Mm-hmm. I agree. And yeah. what happens is we, We care so much about all the external things because when we haven't, or when we were basically like, oh, okay, well, I don't see it that way. The world responded to us in a way that was like, you're weird. You're wrong. How could you think this? That's not right. And it, you know, it doesn't come from a place of conscious. I'm trying to hurt you. It's usually from a place I'm trying to keep you safe. Right. I mean, it's our adults and people in our life that care about us. And we end up in this place in late identified life where it's like, we're handed this whole new thing of, Hey, you're autistic. Yeah. And like, Whoa, you I, know, I you're now exactly got this, the same, right. You just went from like the little tiny fuzzy black and white TV to like the big jumbo yeah. <laughs> TV, right. And 4K. You look back, right. And you look back at your life and you're like, Oh, I missed that. I totally know. Oh, wow. I totally see that now. You know, I yeah. was so autistic in that moment and all this yep. stuff, right? Yeah. And what did I miss? Well, how would life be different if I just yes. known earlier? And all the coulda, woulda, shouldas and the what ifs. And that's part of the process. It really is. And it, I agree. Yep. But one of the things that's really beautiful about the opportunity that we're given in late identified life is that now we have something that most humans never get. We have a moment to stop and reflect Mm -hmm. and to choose with intention and agency where we want our life to go from this point forward. 
And that's what you're doing right now. And I love that. And the other aspect is that a lot of times we have those parts of us and our identity because our identity is so challenged right now. When we get this whole new information that we're autistic, our entire life has just been turned upside down. All the pocket change and the candy from the bottom of your purse has fallen out and you're trying to figure out what the heck, what does this mean? Like my whole life, oh my God, it wasn't what I thought it was. I'm not who I thought I was. And you really are going through this existential identity crisis. At the, at, at a certain I agree. Place, yeah. Right? Like, like really high school huge. all over again. Yeah. It, like right. where you're trying to find yourself all over again, but it's so, isn't it so relieving though? Like that oh, feeling when you yeah. found out, like, like when I found out, um, I cried, I honestly did. Oh, I, yes. like after the thing ended, I was so happy throughout the whole, all I could tell was thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I just remember this. Right. And, and I ended the call cause this was all virtual, um, COVID and all that. And I cried like happy cried, like power cried this out, heaving it the whole bit. And my grandpa had just passed about two weeks ago. And I was so mad in that moment that so my grandfather was very worried about me and worried about he knew something was off and, you know, he wanted something good for me and to be able to finally tell him, like, I figured it out. And I know he knew, but you know, it's not the same, you know what I mean? Telling someone in person yeah. and, and his urn was next to me just by chance. It I where I was sitting was in my living room and I have the urn just on my uh, shelf, one of my shelves. So I was like, we figured it out. We did it. And for the next week, like you said, it was just this Oh, like, I, I can't even tell you how much stress was just gone. And it, it was like, I was re-examining every single moment of my life. And I have to say, you know, some people I know come back and say, I wish I would have known sooner. And I do too, to a point. I actually have accepted that, you know, all through my childhood, all through my, I'd say up to about 20 years old, I've accepted not knowing. And I've said, no, I'm okay with that because you know, the time period that I grew up in, it is what it is. And I've accepted that if I didn't have, if I didn't grow up the way I did, I, I think about the programs that were in place for kids. Do you remember those? Like if you were identified as a child with a, I don't even know what you want to call it. Like a, like a learning disability or something. Don't you remember those different classes and then how people thought of you and all these things and how you were treated so differently And I wonder, this is my thought, and I mean, everybody's different, but I wonder if I would be in the same place now, if I were in one of those places being treated differently, instead of going through what everybody expected me to as a neurotypical and having a different perspective on it and looking around and saying, okay, I did it this way. It didn't work. It was harmful, certainly, but, but did it give me the insight I needed to be where I am right now? Maybe. And then I think, well, my twenties, like, I wish I would have known. <laughs> I think oh. we all have a bit of that reflection point too. Cause you know, I got to that point where I'm just like, Hey, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. I can't change it, No, but I have the power and the agency in my life right now to change everything else coming. Yeah. Like I can change what's happening right now. I can change what goes forward from this point. And, and that was huge because, you know, up until you get the, those beautiful words of you are autistic, or in my case, you were missed. <laughs> Whatever might and, work, right? In right? my words here. <laughs> and in that moment, there is this relief that washes over you. That is yeah. like the responsibility of figuring out why you're so freaking broken is gone. Yeah. You're not broken. Exactly. Cause you're not broken. Out. You're not broken. You're not, there's nothing to fix or figure out. You just perceive the world in a different way. Your brain processes in a different way. Yep. And that is just like, I was like, I'm with you. I cried of sheer joy and relief mm-hmm. I did. of like, oh my God, there's a reason stuff's been so hard. There's a reason this makes no sense to me. Mm -hmm. and from that point you can just go like all right here we are folks now what we now now what do we do and 
And I think now it's been in the last, I mean, I'm not even a year diagnosed yet, like formally. Right. And I'm coming up on my anniversary, but all right. And I, and I think I'm going to get like a cake and everything. Like I'm not even oh, lying. Definitely do it. Definitely. I I'm so excited. And you know, even if I don't, even if I just write the words on it myself, but even it, it doesn't matter. The point is I'm so proud of myself that I'm at this point that I got there, that I figured it out, that I solved the ever continuing problem, as I call it, the ever continuing mystery, whatever you insert word here, you know, that was my life. And now it's okay. Now I know I'm autistic. Great. Now, who am I? And it, now it's been a re-identifying as you, cause you pointed that out. And that was a good point that you, we, we have this sort of perspective of who we are and that, oh, well, we, we don't really fit. Like, you know, when we were diagnosed bipolar, I mean, you have this, well, I'm going to have manic episodes every now and then I'm going to have depressive episodes every now and then, and I may or may not fit da, 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 and all these things. And then people look at you and they, they look at the 20 different movies that are out there that give you bipolar type one at the most extreme level, right? Not under, not managed in any way, shape or form. Oh, and they look at you differently. And then you go, you know, now I'm not that I'm some, I am autistic. So what's my new, where do I want to go with this? What's my new thing? And, and learning to unmask and learning how to embrace that. And I, you know, it, I think, cause you've done it for so long, it's like, it's almost weird, you know, like you telling yourself, yeah, learning how to unmask has just been such a journey. Right. And, um, you know, even discovering my newest interests or things that I didn't even realize were interests <laughs> all this time. Right. Like thing, I don't know, like my bird nerd hobby. I'm such a bird nerd. I call myself. So I've got bird feeders out in the yard. I got birds coming to my hand, Aaron, my, um, my fiance calls me snow white sometimes. Because- oh, I love it. I love it. We'll have to compare notes because I've got my two feeders right outside the window and I love it because it's the perfect time of year because, you know, we're getting the gold fence are coming through and I even heard the Canadian geese at night. They are honking like crazy going over our house. At night? Yes, at night. It's crazy. I've never heard Canadian geese at night. Not at night. But here in Kentucky for the last month, and this is the second year because we've only been here going huh. on three years. This is the second year. I've, I mean, I grew up, you know, they were part of the migration yeah. pattern where I lived on yeah. the coast. So I heard it, but never at night. It's Not crazy. at night. Not and even it's here more at than night. once, right? It's so crazy. Yeah. Like I'm you, curious. One time you fluky, fluky indeed. I, Right. But it's not just like a one-off thing. It's like, no. I've heard them multiple times for two different years. I mean, that's just wild. <laughs> Weird. Yeah. No, I, well, we've got, uh, I've got some chickadees uh, my black cap chickadees are my, my little pals that always oh, come I love visit. them. They're so cute. I, so cute. And I, I wish I could tell the difference between them because it's very hard to tell which one is, you can only go really by their mannerisms. And, um, you know, like if one goes first to the feeder, it's usually the male versus the female will never go first. And, but I can't tell which is which like I, they come up to me and they'll come and sit on me and have their peanut or whatever. And then I don't, I'm like, well, I, I know, I know you, but I don't know which one you are. <laughs> I love it. That is so awesome. We've got those, we've got Cardinals, we've got, and we've got nut hatches, little nut, little. Oh, I little love nut hatches. hatches. They're so cute. It's really so interesting because in the winter, before the goldfinch start to turn, the yes. nut hatch and the goldfinch look very much the same. They're hard to tell yeah. apart. Yep, I agree. They're very, very close. Um, and so, and for all same. you ornithology nuts out there, we're just sharing a little tidbit <laughs> here for the show. You know, yes, you never I'm know what you're going to get on my draw. You never know what you're going to gonna get. Gonna you're gonna get. <laughs> but yeah, so that's my. You know, so as an example, all I was trying to point out though, with all of that was simply that there's an interest that started coming out more so in the last year and a half, I would say that was always kind of there, but it just never really went with it, you know, and now here it is and I wouldn't have it any other way. Right. Oh, I Um, love that. So like, yeah, so it's, it's, so it's, because that's the feedback I've received is that like from people that I know in person and that was, tell me your story. I would love to hear about what you have gone through and connect it to, you know, to being autistic. 
So that, and then hopefully from there, I mean, I am looking into with this uh, vocational assessment, I'm hoping to look into um, coaching and um, specifically, I'd like to look at coaching for our community because as we all know, there is a huge gap in terms of adult services that are available. There's a lot for kids. Certainly there could be way more and they could be even more, you know, dive in, in depth and, and all those things. And I'm not trying to put that down in any way, shape or form. I totally believe that especially in Ontario right now, we're having a huge revolution with that, but I want to just flip that to adults and say, when you look at what there is for kids, there ain't nothing for adults. It's, or it's extremely limited. And when you do find it, you wait on a wait list. How long depends on where you live, depends on how much you want to pay. Um, you know, I know in the UK folks waiting up to, you know, two to three years just to get a diagnosis, just to get on whatever list it is for their NA at the NHS, I believe it is that, yeah. you know, the States, I'm sure it varies by state. I, again, I don't know everything's so I'm not from the States in Canada, it varies by province and, but it every, and each individual province funds its own healthcare, which is in turn funded by our federal government. However, <laughs> fun fact, even though everybody goes, Oh, look, universal healthcare, you guys are great. No, it's not. You want to know why? Because we still wait a long, long time because we don't have enough funding going into these things. And you still end up going through personal insurance plans. Like I had, like I did for my diagnosis, just to get a diagnosis, just to get one at a reasonable time frame, And, you know, like that's just, I mean, you and I both know that unfortunately our community is very underrepresented, un underrepresented. There we go <laughs> in the workforce. So how are we paying for this? How that that's a huge, you know, gap in service and people that deserve these services to get to where they want to go. I'm very lucky to be able to do these things, but I know many are not as in great of a position. So my blog offers a way to sort of give, you know, more or will be offering a way, give my insight, my view out of free way to do it. All you have to do is have internet access, which hopefully most people do. Um, you know, again, that's something I know that people are still struggling with. And then in turn, the coaching, while that will eventually be at a cost, I want to do it at a reduced cost. I think that is more reasonable, or at least have a payment plan option available that will be appropriate for the person given their circumstances. Um, we need, we need that in my community and in Northern Ontario in general. And certainly of course, throughout the, I just call it the internet world. <laughs> everybody, everybody else that's not in Ontario. <laughs> yes. So, so that's my plan. And, and to go from there and see where that takes me. Um, I, I want to do my vocational assessment first, but after that, I, we'll see. Yeah. I am very excited to hear the outcome of that. And I know that that's going to be something that's going to be really beneficial and help you to sort of make some decisions and move forward. And remember, just try it. You know, we find out what we like and what we want in life by experiencing what we don't like. Sometimes that gives right. us a whole lot of clarity. You got to read that <laughs> so it's book. Okay That's what it says. I'm going to check it out. I love it. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having this amazing conversation, Megan. I have yes. thoroughly, thoroughly loved our time together. And hey, I have found another basketball buddy. I love it. So yes. thank you. If you guys have not yet checked out the Autistic Lady blog, go find her on Instagram, follow her link, go check out the Autistic Lady blog. You're going to love it. She's got her book recommendation there. She's got where she's sharing her story and her journey, her journey to her autism identification and so much more. So make sure you reach out. Megan, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Carol Jean, for having me. Welcome to Mind Your Autistic Brain. I'm your host, Carol Jean Whittington. Here in Mind Your Autistic Brain, we are an educational resource for late identified autistic ADHD adults. We are providing programs, training, seminars, and consultation for couples therapists and the workplace. We're so glad you're here joining us. This month, we are launching the NeuroDrive team. This is a division of Mind Your Autistic Brain 
focusing solely on the workforce needs of the neurodivergent population. We are going to be launching our Autistics in the Workforce campaign August the 1st. Please join us. We will be talking all things alignment and accommodations and needs, you know, burnout, those things that when they're not, our needs aren't met, that's where we end up. That chronic cycle loop that you hear me talk about so often. We're also going to be talking about culture. What is the workplace culture? What are the things that are present? What are part of social norms? What are the things that need to shift or change in order to support all employees of all neurotypes, especially in this time of economic recession, where many companies are scaling back? Google recently announced that they will be putting a hiring freeze between now and the end of the year, other than for key um, positions due to the economy and looking to be more innovative and creative. So we also, as employees seeking positions, have to look at, well, what is available? Am I putting my best foot forward? And what are the questions that I should be asking or that I need to be asking to make sure that the corporate or company culture that I'm joining is going to be the best place for me and be supportive of what I do in the world? That work and life harmony is so critical to all of us. And it's something that the great resignation brought to light for all neurotypes. As we move forward, we will also be talking about communication. What are some of the biggest common occurrences in miscommunication at work? What are some insights for the neurotypical person? And what are the insights for the neurodivergent person on both sides of this conversation? How can we bridge our communication and understanding and misalignment gaps that we do have? Because from human to human, we have them, but from neurotype to neurotype, research is showing we definitely have them, but we can do something to improve them. And how do we do that? We will also be diving in and talking about what can we do when we're looking for a position? What can we do when we are hiring? So we're going to be having some conversations on both sides of the table this month. And we will be launching the, this is what autism looks like, autistics in the workforce video campaign, showing what we're doing in the world as autistics. Where are we working now? In what industries and in what positions? It's so exciting. And I can't wait to share some of these fantastic jobs that our amazing neurodivergent people in our community are doing. 